Annie Wood was born in 1847 in London into a middle class family of Irish origin. She was proud of her heritage and supported the cause of Irish self rule throughout her adult life. Her father died when she was five years old, leaving the family almost penniless. Her mother supported the family by running a boarding house for boys at Harrow School. However, S. He was unable to support Annie and persuaded her friend Ellen Marriott to care for her. Marriott made sure that Besant had a good education. She was given a strong sense of duty to society and an equal, by strong sense of what independent women could achieve. As a young woman, she was also able to travel widely in Europe. There she acquired a taste for Roman Catholic color and ceremony that never left her. In 1867, at age 20, she married 26-year-old clergyman Frank Besant. He was an evangelical Anglican who seemed to share many of her concerns. On the eve of her marriage, she had become mopey. Politicized through a visit to friends in Manchester, who brought her into contact with both English radicals and the Manchester martyrs of the Irish Republican Fenian Brotherhood, as well as with the conditions of the urban poor. Soon Frank became vicar of Sibzi in Lincolnshire. Annie moved to Sibzi with her husband, and within a few years they had two children, Arthur and Mabel. However, the marriage was a disaster. As Annie wrote in her autobiography, we were an ill-matched pair. The first conflict came over money and Annie's independence. Annie wrote short stories, books for children, and articles. As married women did not have the legal right to own property, Frank was able to collect all the money she earned. Politics further divided the couple. Annie began to support farm workers, who were fighting to unionize and to win better conditions. Frank was a Tory and sided with the landlords and farmers. The tension came to a head when Annie refused to attend communion. In 1873 she left him and returned to London. They were legally separated and Annie took her daughter with her. Besant began to question her own faith. She turned to leading churchmen for advice going to see Edward Bouverie Pusey, one of the leaders of the Oxford movement within the Church of England. When she asked him to recommend books that would answer her questions, he told her she had read too many already. She fought for the causes she thought were right, starting with freedom of thought, women's rights, secularism, birth control, Fabian socialism and workers' rights. She was a leading member of the National Secular Society alongside Charles Bradlaugh and the South Place Ethical Society. Divorce was unthinkable for Frank and was not really within the reach of even middle class people. Annie Wa is to remain Mrs. Besant for the rest of her life. At first, she was able to keep contact with both children and to have Mabel live with her, she also got a small allowance from her husband. Once free of Frank Besant and exposed to new currents of thought, she began to question not only her long-held religious beliefs but also the whole of conventional thinking. She began to write attacks on the C.H. Urchers and the way they controlled people's lives. In particular, she attacked the status of the Church of England as a state-sponsored faith. Soon she was earning a small weekly wage by writing a column for the National Reformer, the newspaper of the NSS. The NSS argued for a secular state and an end to the special status of Christianity and allowed her to act as one of its public speakers. Publi. See lectures were very popular entertainment in Victorian times. Besant was a brilliant speaker and was soon in great demand. Using the railway, she crisscrossed the country, speaking on all of the most important issues of the day, always demanding improvement, reform and freedom. For many years Besant was a friend of the National Secular Society's leader, Charles Bradlaugh. Bradlaugh, a former soldier, had long been separated from his wife, Besant lived with him and his daughters, and they worked together on many projects. He was an atheist and a Republican, he was also trying to get elected as Member of Parliament MP for Northampton. Besant and Bradlaugh became household names in 1877 when they published Fruits of Philosophy, a book by the American birth control campaigner Charles Knowlton. It claimed that working class families could never be happy until they were able to decide how many children they wanted. It also suggested ways to limit the size of their families. The Knowlton book was highly controversial and was vigorously opposed by the church. Besant and Bradlaugh proclaimed in the National Reformer, the pair were arrested and put on trial for publishing the Knowlton book. They were found guilty, but released pending appeal. 
As well as great opposition, Besant and Bradlaugh also received a great deal of support in the liberal press. Arguments raged back and forth. In the letters and comment columns as well as in the courtroom. Besant was instrumental in founding the Malkushan League during the trial, which would go on to advocate for the abolition of penalties for the promotion of contraception. For a time, it looked as though they would be sent to prison. The case was thrown out finally only on a technical point, the charges not having been properly drawn up. The scandal cost Besant custody of her children. Her husband was able to persuade the court that she was unfit to look after them and they were handed over to him permanently. On the 6th of March 1881s, he spoke at the opening of Leicester Secular Society's new secular hall in Hammerstone Gate, Leicester. The other speakers were George Jacob Holyoke, Harriet Law and Charles Bradlaugh. Meanwhile, B. Sunk built close contacts with the Irish home rulers and supported them in her newspaper columns during what are considered crucial years, when the Irish nationalists were forming an alliance with liberals and radicals. Besant met the leaders of the Irish home rule movement. In particular, she got to know Michael Davitt, who wanted to mobilize the Irish peasantry through a land war, a direct struggle against the landowners. She spoke and wrote in favor of David and his Land League many times over the coming decades. Political activism. For Besant, politics, friendship and love were always closely intertwined. Her decision in favor of socialism came about through a close relationship with George Bernard Shaw, a struggling young Irish author living in London, and a leading light of the Fabian Society. Annie was impressed by his work and grew very close to him too in the early 1880. It was Besant who made the first move by inviting Shaw to live with her. This he refused, but it was Shaw who sponsored Besant to join the Fabian Society. In its early days, the society was a gathering of people exploring spiritual, rather than political, alternatives to the capitalist system. Besant began to write for the Fabians. This new commitment and her relationship with Shaw deepened the split between Besant and Bradlaugh, who was an individualist and opposed to socialism of any sort while he defended free speech at any cost. He was very cautious about encouraging working-class militancy. Besant met the women and set up a committee, which led the women into a strike for better pay and conditions. An action that won public support. Besant led demonstrations by match girls, who were cheered in the streets, and prominent churchmen wrote in their support. In just over a week they f. asked the firm to improve pay and conditions. Besant then helped them to set up a proper union and a social center. At the time, the matchstick industry was a very powerful lobby, since electric light was not yet widely available. And matches were an essential commodity. In 1872, lobbyists from the match industry had persuaded the British government to change its planned tax policy. Besant's camper. I was the first time anyone had successfully challenged the match manufacturers on a major issue and was seen as a landmark victory of the early years of British socialism. Theosophy. Besant was a prolific writer and a powerful orator. In 1889, she was asked to write a review for the Pall Mall Gazette on the Secret Doctrine, a book by H. P. Blavatsky. After reading it, she sought an interview with its author. Meeting Blavatsky in Paris. In this way she was converted to theosophy. Besant's intellectual journey had always involved a spiritual dimension, a quest for transformation of the whole person. As her interest in theosophy deepened, she allowed her membership of the Fabian Society to lapse 1890 and broke her links with the Marxists. In her autobiography, Besant follows her chapter on socialism with through strong to peace the peace of theosophy. In 1888, she described herself as marching toward the theosophy, that would be the glory of her life. Besant had found the econ. Omak side of life lacking a spiritual dimension, so she searched for a belief based on love. She found this in theosophy, so she joined the Theosophical Society, a move that distanced her from Bradel or and other former activist co-workers. When Blavatsky died in 1891, Besant was left as one of the leading figures in theosophy and in 1893 she represented it at the Chicago World Fair. In 1893 s. Owen after becoming a member of the Theosophical Society she went to India for the first time. After a dispute the American section split away into an independent organization. The original society, then led by Henry Steele Olcott and Besant is today based in Chennai, India, and is known as the Theosophical Society Adyar. 
Following the split Besson devoted much of her energy not only to the society, but also to India's freedom and progress. Besant Nagar, a neighborhood near the Theosophical Society in Chennai, is named in her honor. Co-Freemasonry Besant's of Freemasonry, in particular Co-Freemasonry. As an extension of her interest in the rights of women and the greater brotherhood of man and saw Co-Freemasonry as a movement which practiced true brotherhood, in which women and men worked. Side by side for the perfecting of humanity. She immediately wanted to be admitted to this organization, known now as the International Order of Freemasonry for Men and Women, Le Droit Humain. The L. Inc. was made in 1902 by the theosophist Francesca Arundel, who accompanied Besant to Paris along with six friends. They were all initiated, passed and raised into the first three degrees and Annie returned to England. Bearing a charter and founded there the first lodge of international mixed masonry, Le Droit Humain. Besant eventually became the order's most puissant grand commander and was a major influence in the international growth of the order. President of Theosophical Society Until Besant's presidency, the society had as one of its foci Theravada Buddhism and the island of Sri Lanka, where Henry Olcott did the majority of his useful work. Under Besant's leadership there was more stress on the teachings of the Ayavarta, as she called Central India, as well as on esoteric Christianity. Besant set up a new school for boys, the Central Hindu College at Banaras which was formed on underlying theosophical principles and which counted many prominent theosophists in its staff and faculty. Its aim was to build a new leadership for India. The students spent 90 minutes a day in prayer and studied religious texts but they also studied modern science. It took three years to raise the money for the CHC, most of which came from Indian princes. In April 1911, Besant met Pandit Madan Mohan Malavir and they decided to unite their forces and work for a common Hindu university at Banaras. Besant and fellow trustees of the Central Hindu College also agreed to Government of India's precondition that the college should become a part of the new university. The Banaras Hindu Univer City started functioning from 1 October 1917 with the Central Hindu College as its first constituent college. Blavatsky had stated in 1889 that the main purpose of establishing the society was to prep a humanity for the future reception of a torchbearer of truth, an emissary of a hidden spiritual hierarchy that, according to theosophists, guides the evolution of mankind. This was repeated by Besant as early as 1896. Besant came to believe in the imminent appearance of the emissary, who was identified by theosophists as the so-called world teacher. World Teacher Project in 1909, soon after Besant's assumption of the presidency, Leadbeater discovered 14 year old Jiddu Krishnamurti, a South Indian boy who had been living with his father and brother on the grounds of the He, headquarters of the Theosophical Society at Adyar, and declared him the probable vehicle for the expected world teacher. The discovery and its objective received widespread publicity and attracted worldwide following, mainly among theosophists. It also started years of upheaval and contributed to splits in the Theosophical Society and doctrinal schisms in Theosophy. Following the discovery, J. Iddu Krishnamurti and his younger brother Nityananda were placed under the care of Theosophists and Krishnamurti was extensively groomed for his future mission as the new vehicle for the world teacher. Besant soon became the boy's legal guardian with the consent of their father who was very poor and could not take care of them. However, his father later changed his mind and began a legal battle to regain the guardianship. Against the will of the boys. Early in their relationship, Krishnamurti and Besant had developed a very close bond and he considered her a surrogate mother a role she happily accepted. In 1929, 20 years after his discovery, Krishnamurti, who had grown disenchanted with the World Teacher Project, repudiated the role that many theosophists expected him to fulfill. He dissolved the Order of the Star in the East, an organization founded to assist the world teacher in his mission and eventually left the Theosophical Society and Theosophy at large. He spent the rest of his life traveling the world as an unaffiliated speaker, becoming in the process widely known as an original, independent thinker on philosophical, psychological and spiritual subjects. His love for Besant never waned. As also was the case with Besant's feelings towards him, concerned for his well-being after he declared his independence, she had purchased six acres of land near the Theosop. 
Hikal Society Estate which later became the headquarters of the Krishnamurti Foundation India. Home Rule Movement Along with her theosophical activities, Peasant continued to actively participate in political matters. She had joined the Indian National Congress. As the name suggested, this was originally a debating body, which met each year to consider resolutions on political issues. Mostly it dem, and did more of a say for middle class Indians in British Indian government. It had not yet developed into a permanent mass movement with local organization. In 1914 World War I broke out and Britain a scud for the support of its empire in the fight against Germany. Echoing an Irish nationalist slogan, Besant declared, England's need is India's opportunity. As editor of the New India newspaper, SH, he attacked the colonial government of India and called for clear and decisive moves towards self-rule. As with Ireland, the government refused to discuss any changes while the war lasted. In 1916 Basa, NT launched the All India Home Rule League along with Lokmanya Tilak once again modelling demands for India on Irish nationalist practices. This was the first political party in India to have regime change as its main goal. Unlike the Congress itself, the League worked all year round. It built a structure of local branches, enabling it to mobilize demonstrations, public meetings and agitations. In June 1917 Besant was arrested and interned at a hill station, where she definitely flew a red and green flag. The Congress and the Muslim League together threatened to launch protests if she were not set free. Besant's arrest had created a focus for protest. The government was forced to give way and to make vague but significant concessions. It was announced that the ultimate aim of British rule was Indian self-government. And moves in that direction were promised. Besant was freed in September 1917, welcomed by crowds all over India, and in December she took over as president of the Indian National Congress for a year. After the war, a new leadership emerged around Mohandas K. Gandhi, one of those who had written to demand Besant's release. He was a lawyer who had returned from leading Asians in a peaceful struggle against racism in South Africa. Jawaharlal Nehru, Gandhi's closest collaborator, had been educated by a theosophist tutor. The new leadership was committed to action that was both militant and non-violent. But there were differences between them and Besant. Despite her past, she was not happy with their socialist leanings. Until the end of her life, however, she conti. New to campaign for India's independence, not only in India but also on speaking tours of Britain. In her own version of Indian dress, she remained a striking presence on speakers' platforms. She pro-duced a torrent of letters and articles demanding independence. Death. In 1931 she became ill in India. Besant died on 20 September 1933, at age 85, in Adyar, Madras Presidency, British India. Her body was cremated. She was survived by her daughter, Mabel. After her death, colleagues Jiddu Krishnamurti, Aldous Huxley, Guido Ferrano, and Rosalind Rajagopal built the Happy Valley School in California, now renamed the Besant Hill School of Happy Valley in her honor.